Hello everyone, my name is Long Jun Luo. You can call me Long Jun. Uh, I am an engineer from Huawei. I worked at Huawei for three years after obtaining my bachelor's degree. My work is mainly about the seamless kernel update and the live patch. As we all know, live patch in the kernel is a hot topic. To support live patch in the kernel, communities have developed many tools. One of the most famous is the K-Patch. We utilize it to solve many problems in our products. And one day, our customers ask us, why can't I use K-Patch for user-based programs like glibc and OpenSSL? Yeah, why? I ask myself. Everything starts from this question. In the recent half a year, my group has tried to apply live patch techniques for user space programs. We borrow many ideas from KPatch and CIU. CIU is a popular checkpoint and restore tool in user space. I am honored to share with you what we have done so far. This presentation will be divided into four parts. Firstly, we will talk about the general rules of the live patch mechanism. What is the critical problem and how does live patch takes effect? Secondly, we will talk about the differences between the kernel and the user space programs. Why can we use KPATCH for user space programs directly? For these differences, what are the current strategies? And then, we will talk about our practice of the live patch in user space. How do we solve problems with the help of uprobe, which is a trace mechanism in the Linux kernel? Uh, you may not hear about the uprobe, but you must know kprobe. By the way, our developing project is called upatch. Finally, we will talk about our future plan. So, what are the general rules about the live patch? Basically, we need three steps to implement the live patch mechanism. Build the patch, load the patch, and apply the patch. Quite easy, right? Uh, kind of like getting an elephant into a refrigerator in three steps. <laughs> well, we, we will talk about these three steps one by one. To build the patch, we need a knowledge about the EOF and the binary relocations. EOF has three main types, relocatable files, uh, executable files, and shared object files. A relocatable file is an intermediate format. After the link stage, several relocatable files can become executable or shared object files. No matter the type it is, EOF is all composed of sections. In other words, section is the best unit of the EOF. When a process starts to execute, it will put sections with the same privilege together. Now these sections have become a segment. Different sections can reference each other, like reading data or calling functions. If we can't decide the offset of the reference position compared to the current one, then we need a relocation entry. Here is a code written in C language. We will use this code as an example in the whole part. The code is simple. We have four functions and, uh, and several data. After applying the different file, function 3 and function 4 have changed, while function 5 keeps the same. In function 5, we refer to four parts. Function 1, date C, function 3, and function 4. After compiling this code, we have three relocation entries. Since function 1 is external, its offset is not sure. For function 4, it is a static function. Also, function 4 and function 5 are all in the text section. So function 5 knows the offset of function 4 precisely. So there is no need to generate a relocation entry for function 4. Function 3 is also in the test section. But function 3 
is a global function. The compiler still generates a relocation entry for it. For data C, it is not in that test section. Check the corresponding assembly code on the right. For these relocation entries, the compiler will fill them with zeros temporarily. The static linker can reserve some relocation entries like function 3 here, and some relocation entries must be reserved until the uh, execution stage by the dynamic linker. Check this picture here. We can have an overall view. So for, e for the EOF file, we have three rules now. First, an ELF file is composed of sections. Second, when a section refers to one part of another section and the compiler is not sure of the offset, it generates a relocation entry. Third, in the link stage, the offset between some sections is fixed, so the static linker can re re reserve some relocation entries until execution the dynamic linker will determine the other references. For example, uh, references for functions from shared libraries. Since relocatable files keep the most reference information, we use them to build the patch. We all know codes are co composed of date and functions. After applying different files, three changes are possible. New, modified, and deleted. In our example, that B is deleted, that E is new. Function 2 is deleted, function 3 and function 4 are modified, function 6 is new. When we build the patch, what we do is find modified functions. These modified functions may refer to other new parts, like function 6 here. So, build the patch can be defined like this. Build the patch is, after applying different files, compile and uh, find the parts which includes modified functions or are referred by modified functions. According to our definition, it should look like this. Function 3 and function 4 are modified functions. They have reference for function 6 and date E. So our patch includes function 3, function 4, function 6, and date E. But there are two problems here. First, how can we correlate these sections? Second, how can we compile each pair of sections? The answer to the first question is simple. We correlate sections based on their symbol names. For static symbols, we compile their related file symbols. We will not discuss details here. Roughly speaking, we use memory compile to compile paired sections to solve the second question, but some more compile parameters are necessary. Check our example one more time. We compiled it two times and separated the assembly code of function 5 from the relocatable file. As we discussed before, function 5 keeps the same, and function 5 has a reference for function 4, whose offset is sure. Suppose we use memory compile to compile these paired sections. Oops, we find they are different. The problem here is the fixed offset of function 4 has changed. No more help or information here. It is almost impossible for us to judge their differences. Well, if we can put function 4 in a different section, we can make this place become a relocation entry. If it becomes a relocation entry, it will not affect the result of, of the memory compiler. As we discussed, the compiler temporarily fills the relocation entry with zeros. Luckily, GCC has two parameters for this situation. 
the parameter f data sections makes each state into a separate section. The parameter f function sections makes each function into a separate section. So we need to compile our codes with these two parameters twice. Another advantage of these two parameters is it is easier to organize the patch since the basic unit of the ELF file is the section. Is that enough for building the patch? Check this code one more time. This time we compile the assembly code of function 3. As we discussed, function 3 has changed. But when we use memory compile to compile them, we found they are the same. Why? Well, although function 3 has uh, caused different functions, memory contents are all filled with zeros. The solution is easy. We use memory compile for each pair of section to compile their contents first, and then compile their relocation entries one by one. If all results are identical, we say these pair of sections are the same. So building the patch looks like this. Each function and data has a separate section. And we find sections which modify functions and then put them together with their related sections to generate a new relocatable file, the patch. Concrete steps for building the patch are here. First, add compiler parameters to make each state and a function a separate section. Second, build the source co code and remember each relocatable file path. Third, apply different files, repeat step two. Fourth, for each paired relocatable file, correlate sections between two files, uh, then compile each paired section by checking their memory content and relocation entries. Find the sections that include modified functions or are referred to by modified functions. Generate a relocatable patch file. Fifth, link all patch files into a final patch. Let's talk about step two, load the patch. This step is simple. I map the patch, reserve its symbols and finish relocations. We use the address from the process memory to handle the same symbol. But for the modified symbol, we use the address from the patch memory address. In the example of function 6, date A comes from the process memory, while date E comes from the patch memory address. Because we must ensure that the patch sees a constant memory. Now we know how to build the patch and how to load the patch. The final step is to apply the patch, which means threads will see patched functions whenever they execute modified functions. Like how to save registers when calling a function. We also have two ways to apply the patch, uh, coe modification and a colon modification. In our example, Function 5 calls function 3, and function 3 is modified in the patch. For coe modification, we add instructions like jump or call in the entry of the function 3 in the process memory. Anytime the original function 3 is executed, it will directly jump to the patched function 3. This modification can solve almost all situations, except for the shared library. Test sections of the shared library must be read only in all stage stages. The purpose of this design is to reduce the usage of memory pages. For color modification, we update all places with new offsets. Two problems here. First, length of the new offset may change from 16 to 32. We can't override the memory places of the later instructions. Second, for function pointers, we have no idea to find them since 
we can only find these places with the help of relocation entries. These two problems do not exist for shared libraries because shared libraries have GOT and PLT sections. All references for shared libraries are transferred from GOT and PLT sections. So we can update GOT and PLT sections directly. The biggest problem with applying the patch is we need to find a safe moment. To talk about memory safety, we need to introduce a new concept, the constancy mo model. I will use the description from the kernel document to introduce this concept. Each function has a defined semantic. It takes some input parameters, gets or releases logs, and handles some data in a defined way. Many fixes do not change the semantics of the modified functions. For example, they add a noun pointer or a boundary check, fix a race condition by adding a missing memory barrier, or add, a, add some locking around a critical section. Most of these changes are self-contained, and the function presents the same for the rest of the system. In this case, we can update the functions independently one by one. But there are more complex fixes. For example, a patch might simultaneously change the ordering of locking in multiple functions, or a patch might exchange the meaning of some temporary structures and update all the relevant functions. In this case, the affected unit, like threads, must start using all new versions of the functions at the same time. Also, the switch must happen only when it is safe. For example, when the affected logs are released or no data are stored in the modified structures at the, at the moment. Finding a moment when the usage of the new implementation can meet defined conditions so that the system stays constant is the so-called constancy model. In our example, function 3 and function 4 are modified functions. At one specific moment, we check the stake of all threads. Their stacks look like this, thread 1 and thread 2 executed modified functions, while thread 3 and thread 4 are safe. If we use the constancy model from kpatch, which asks all threads to switch to the new implementation at the same time, this moment is unsafe for all threads. But if we use the constancy model from the kernel lab patch, which asks threads to switch to the new implementation one by one. We call this model per, per thread. With this mo model at this moment, uh, thread 3 and thread 4 will use the new implementation, while your thread 1 and thread 2 should wait for other moments. Now we have a basic view of how the lab patch mechanism works. Let's see the concrete process of the kpatch. First, kpatch sets the CC environment variable to point to a shell script named kpatch CC. This script will handle compiler parameters for us. Second, kpatch will build the kernel codes twice and remember the path of each relocatable file. Third, kpatch compile each paired relocatable file and uh, generate a relocatable patch file. Fourth, kpatch link all these relocatable files into a final patch. Fifth, combine with the kernel module mechanism, kpatch handles it further, making it a kernel module. Uh, we can apply this patch by inserting this KO file into the kernel. As we discussed, the constancy model of the kernel live patch handles threads one by one. The, can, the 
kernel can finish this with the help of the F trace mechanism. The patch kernel module we generated before will add a live patch handler for all modified functions at the entry of their memory by using the call instruction. Each time threads executed modified functions, it will execute the handler first. The live patch handler will check the thread to see if it is safe. If safe, overwrite the written address to make it execute new implementations. If not, continue the original implementations. So, can we use kpatch for programs in the user space directly? Well, the answer is partly yes. There are some differences between the kernel and the user, the user space. We will talk about them now. Still, we discuss the live patch mechanism in three parts. First, to build the patch, we must add parameters for the compiler. Kpatch does this by modifying the CC environment variable. It works fine in most situations. However, building systems in user, spa in user space are varied. For example, I can write a makefile that ignores the CC variable, or I may need the CC variable to do a cross compile. Is there a better approach to adding parameters for the compiler? This approach should be transparent to building systems. We will talk about it in the third part of this presentation. Second, to load the patch, no module mechanism anymore, and the code injection has become necessary. One more example, we only have one kernel space, but for an ELF file, it could, it could be mapped into different process memory spaces. How can we recognize processes which need the specific patch? Third, to apply the patch, we don't have the FJS mechanism in either space. We have no way to use the per task constancy model in this situation. The current strategy of recognizing target processes is to scan all threads information one by one to see their memory usage and check if this process needs a specific pass, patch. For example, we build a patch for libc after scanning the maps file in the proc directory. We find th three processes, but if we build a patch for the ngx, only the first and the third need it. Uh, after a brute search, we find the target process. Now we need to load the patch for this process. Code injection is necessary here. In user space, we do the code injection with the help of the ptrace mechanism. And the proc file system. Uh, concrete steps are here. First, attach the thread with the, with the help of ptrace. Second, save the original context like register values. Third, find some memory with its execute privilege, save its original content and copy injected code into it. Fourth, construct register context to execute injected code. Fifth, after finishing execution, restore the original context and the memory content. Six, detach the thread. The implementation profoundly depends on the ptrace mechanism and is quite complicated. To do the stack trace, we have to repeat these steps for all threads in the process one by one. Also, we have no FTRS mechanism in user space, so we can only use the most strict constancy model that all threads switch together. But in most cases, it is unnecessary. And one day, I thought maybe I could add a custom FTRS handler for programs in user space with the help of the code injection. 
It works like this. We meticulously design some code and inject it into the process memory space. The problem is there is no nope instruction in the entry of each function. Since the, the jump instruction occupies five bytes in x86, we have to modify its beginning several instructions to jump to our handler. As we discussed, some threads may, may need to execute their original functions. In this case, we have to re-execute instructions that are overwritten by the jump instruction. It is fine to handle kinds like push instructions. We only need to remember its content and execute it again. For PC relative instructions, it isn't easy to find proper approaches. It seems we can only accept a limit consistency model in user space. Luckily, we have the uprob, and the uprob will solve all these problems for us. Uprob provides an entirely different view to the live patch in user space. Let me introduce the uprob first. It is a tracing mechanism, and it looks like the K-probe, but it works in user space. Its core API looks like, like this. Three parameters are needed. The first is an inode point that comes from a file path. The second is a file offset. The third is a group of ha kernel handlers. When a map happens, the uprob mechanism will replace the content of the offset of the file with a soft interrupt instructions. In x86, the soft instruction interrupt the soft interrupt instruction is 0xcc. When replacement begins, the uprob mechanism will check the mapping list from the inode to replace their contents one by one. And then it will add a check at the entry of the mmap syscall. So it can handle all further mmap actions of this file pass. In conclusion, all, mem all memory places from different address spaces that correspond to the offset of this file pass will be replaced with the soft interrupt instruction. The soft interrupt, soft interrupt instruction will trigger the register kernel handler, handler whenever threads execute this place. Within the kernel handler, we can override its written address in the stack. So we can trick another kind of kernel handler when threads return from the function. Two kinds of handlers are called the probe and the return probe. Cur currently, uprobe is not powerful enough to support the live patch mechanism in user space. We add some enhancement to it. These patches will soon be organized and sent to the community for further discussion. Now it is time to see the magic of the uprobe. Still, we discuss the live patch mechanism in three parts. To build the patch, as we discussed before, we need to hijack the compiler so that we can modify its parameters. Kpatch uses the CC environment variable to do this. It works in most situations, but still has some trivial problems. Is there anything you probe can do about this problem? Yes. Don't forget the compiler itself is an ELF file. We set up a kernel handler at the entry point of the compiler file. We can read the entry point of the ELF file from its program header. No matter how the build system works, it always executes the compiler. The program will have a, the program have a certain initial process stack at the entry point. We can explain the stake and read all arguments and environment variables according to the description of the initial stake. 
we can know if it is compiles the source or patched code based on the specific environment variable. We can take different actions for it. Maybe users uh, compile normal codes and no handler is needed in this situation. In our situation, we will take these steps. First, modify the stack to add or to add or deleted some compiler parameters or environment variables. Second, and map a memory page filled with the with a Cisco instruction into the address space. Third, modify register context to let the thread execute a new uh, exe cve Cisco. With the help of the uprobe, we have no constraints for the build system. The compiler's file path is the only thing we need to know about the build system. It should not be a problem. Also, we can use this approach for all EOF files. For example, someday we may need to hijack the linker. It works the same way. To load the patch, we must recognize the target process that needs specific patches by brute searching. With the help of the uprop, we only need to register a kernel handler for all these modified functions. We load the patch within the handler. There is no need to for, for us to search all processes. Now we apply the patch for the EI file itself, not for the process. Before discussing how to apply the patch, let's talk about the essence of the constancy model. As we discussed before, threads need to see a constancy model. Some functions need to be switched together. In other words, when a, when a switch happens, there are no these functions in the stack of some threads. We don't care about the order of functions in the stack. We care about the count of care about the count of these functions. It may be a little confusing. Imagine at a specific moment, we stop all threads from uh, address space. We check all stacks of threads. We make a count table. In this table, we can see how many times one modified, modified functions is executed by one thread. For the k-patch, it asks us all threads to switch together, so all values from this table should be zero. For the kernel live patch, it switches threads one by one, so the kernel live patch only needs the specific line to be zero. The constancy model is no more than a math constraint for this table. In the k patch or the kernel live patch, we set up a constancy model for the system. But if we can maintain a count table like this, each patch can have its own constancy model. Because in most cases, like adding a boundary check, even no constancy model is needed. This count table gives us the best, best flex, flexibility. flexibility. The problem is how can we obtain this count table? Well, we do it by code injection. This time, we do not rely on the pictures to count them one by one. The ideal approach to handle this problem should be like a signal handler. Each time we need this count table, we send a signal, and then all threads update this table together. Of course, we cannot really use signals. Our design works like this. First, we, st we stop all threads. Second, we map a file with customer injected code into the address space and make relocations for it. The API of the injected code looks like this. We use the register context to do stack trace. And we compile the function address from the stack with address range from modified functions so that we can update the count table we discussed before. Each thread updates its own line, so no mutex or log is needed. So that we record the context of each thread and modify registers to let the thread execute the injected code. The injected code is a self-contained raw uh, execution file. It has no dependency on other libraries or code. It has its own stake, 
so its execution will not affect the original program. Fourth, at the end of the injected code, we trigger another uprobe handler because the injected code is also a year an year file. When injected code finishes, we will read the consistency model setting from the patch's metadata to see if it is safe to apply the patch. Finally, we restore the context of each thread. We clean the in injected code if necessary. The idea of this approach is mainly from the compare program or CIU. Without the F-trace mechanism, you may ask how to use the thread model in user space. Well, this time we have the UPROB handler now. If we choose the per task uh, thread model, when some threads are safe and some are not, we call this period the transition stage. In the transition stage, we will not use jump instructions directly. To handle safe threads, we let it execute patches code by modifying its PC register. But for unsafe threads, it will normally return from the UPROB handler. In the transition stage, threads will suffer from a trivial performance penalty. All threads must switch between user space and kernel when executing modified functions. When all threads become safe, we will overwrite several memory places with jump instructions at the entry and at the function's entry. Since then, threads will trigger no more. Uh, no more you uh, since then threads will trigger no more you probe handlers because the the soft interrupt instruction is replaced with the jump instruction so there is no more performance penalty in this way we can support the per thread task in user space as we discussed we need to maintain a count table to find a safe moment with the help of injected code and uh, the UPRO mechanism, we can obtain it whenever we need it. It is a waste to run this code periodically because it will step all threads, even though this period is so short. Can we obtain this count table once and then update it when necessary? Of course, do not forget that UPRO is a tracing mechanism. When we load the patch, we initialize the count table for the first time. Then we register the probe and the return probe for all modified functions. Anytime threads end or leave modified functions, we can update this count table in time. In this way, we can maintain this table with this count table with minimal cost. Each time we modify this table, we will check if it is safe to apply the patch. Combined with the transition stage we discussed, we can provide the most extensive flexibility for each patch. The problem here is that you probably may find the wrong place of the written address in some situations, because in x86, the written address is stored in the stake. We can solve this problem with the help of call frame information. UPROB is so helpful for the live patch in user space because it, it provides two rules for user, user, user space programs. First, it eliminates the gap between ELF files and processes. Second, combined with the soft interrupt instruction and code injection, we can handle the patch both in kernel space and user space. Some immature ideas are not included here, and I am not sure if, if it is feasible. One of the immature ideas is the pre-link for the live patch. If the patch is, is big, locating it could cost a lot of time. In this situation, we can do the relocations in advance. Because of the address space layout random, random, randomization, two problems need to be solved. First, we must decide the memory location of the patch. We can do this by re reserving the memory for the patch when registering the handler. Second, we must decide each load bios for all ELF files. We can calculate this by scan mmaps file contained in the proc file system. Combined with the symbol table from the ELF files, we can do the relocation relocations separately. Whenever it is needed, we can mmap it directly. 
we have seen the potential power of the uprop for the lab patch in user space. Uh, we are trying to develop a new framework called the UPatch. Here is the plan. Uh, it will be an open source project below, below the OpenOla community. Here is the link. Um, we still have many technical problems to handle. Due to the limit of my knowledge, there could be something wrong with this presentation. Corrections and more discussions are welcome. Here is my email address. Uh, that's all of this presentation. I hope you guys enjoy it. Bye-bye.